Hello, podcast family. Uh, Summer Gilbert here, and thank you for listening to another bonus episode of the Doc Lounge podcast. This is part of our COVID-19 series, and this is episode number three. Um, I'll spare you with a long introduction because this one is so awesome and I can't wait for you guys to to listen. So without further ado, here is bonus episode number three of our COVID-19 series. So today on the podcast, we have nurse practitioner Julie Beeler. She specializes in family practice and emergency medicine. So Julie, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Thanks. I'm so glad to be here. And of course, we are all social distancing. So Julia is in rural Iowa and uh, Mark and I are in Southern California, but we're all um, in the comfort of our homes right now, um, obviously with what's going on. And so we wanted to talk to Julie about what she's seeing in Iowa and, uh, you know, especially in a rural location too and, and, and how they're handling covid so, Julie, if you could just kind of give us, just to summarize, um, tell our listeners, you know, where you're at and, um, you know, your current work situation, uh, just to kind of give them a little background. So, I'm actually working in a very small rural farming community in Hartley, Iowa, which is in the northwest uh, area of Iowa. Um, so, like, the total county population is about around 14,000, maybe a little less than that. And so it's very rural. Um, I take care of zero to 99. That is my age group of patients that I see. We have a high uh, amount of elderly patients that I take care of that have no access to any type of internet. Um, when when you say the word Wi-Fi, they look at me like a <laughs> like I'm from another planet. So that's <laughs> that's uh, it, that's where our telemed um, is very lacking uh, with a lot of these folks. Um, and just to kind of give you kind of a little bit of the culture of um, th- this is a stoic area of people that they. I mean we we live in some pretty harsh weather and um, people kind of uh, are in their homes. And so to travel long distances in terrible weather is just not feasible for some of these folks. And so that's why we need to have these small little community clinics out there for folks. Um, Now, um, what's happening is, is that due to everybody um, not coming into the clinics and uh, the social distancing, which it needs to be done, we have, uh, we have clinics that are closing because we're just not busy enough. We have ERs that, you know, they were seeing over hundreds of patients. They're maybe seeing maybe 35 And so we have the exact opposite of what's happening in the East and West Coast um, because it's like crickets everywhere. So we're doing our best to expand our telemed services to see patients. I mean, I've got colleagues that are using their personal cell phones to call patients, to FaceTime them. I would be one of them because all of this kind of hit all of a sudden and nobody was trained on how to do the telemed um, yeah. services. And so, you know, even getting people to get their labs drawn, how are they, where are they going to go to get their labs drawn? And so people are, um, they're frightened because they yeah. don't know what's going to happen with their healthcare providers. And I, I personally, we, I, I'm sitting in a clinic right now and I have my nurses that are packing vaccines away to go to the major um, hospitals. And this is their last day because they're all being furloughed. Wow. Um, I have uh, my neighbor that just walked over. Um, This is Cassandra Karn and she's a PA at um, a ER here in Orange County. And so she's going to kind of jump in and, uh, 
join the podcast. Um, so I just wanted to give her a quick introduction. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi there. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hi. So um, this is interesting to kind of hear all these perspectives. Well, and that's the thing is our ER ha- it will um, remain open, and so will our hospital. Will continue to remain open. Um, the issue with that is is that basically we've all been cut down one day a week. All of the providers. I do know mm. that one provider did take the furlough um, because. She, she did not want to work in the emergency room. So, but we have plenty of providers to cover the emergency room services. So it's me and two physicians and another nurse practitioner that will be covering the emergency room and the Hmm. hospital. Our hospital is the same. We all had several shifts cut in the year. Yeah. It just, and again, it just, it just doesn't make sense that, that, that that would be the case, you know, and especially in your case, Julie, if, uh, you know, we work, uh, we have a longstanding relationship with Sanford Health um, in Sioux Falls. So I know that you mentioned that that's a place where, you know, if people need to go on a ventilator, they need, you know, uh, maybe more urgent care, or I, you know, ID doc or whatever they can, they can go to the Sioux Falls. But it just seems to me that if we're going to have these bigger hospitals are going to be overrun with their, with their ERs, then maybe the the smaller hospitals with their ERs, that's kind of a, a, a relief. Like that's the first go-to before they go to the big hospitals. So I guess, again, you know, from, from my standpoint, not being a clinician, ladies, is just, it just seems weird that from an ER standpoint, anyway, from a clinic standpoint, I, I get the, I get the furlough, I get the, uh, the reduced hours or, you know, mandatory PTO days and things of that nature. But it just seems very, very odd to me. Well, the the plan was that we would not be, uh, I mean, obviously we don't have a ventilator, so we wouldn't be able to right, take right. care of those folks, but we would, sure. we, we would take care of what we could take care of. Gotcha. And uh, because that's what a critical access hospital is. And, right. and so I, and our peak isn't supposed to be peaking until April 26. Now, oh, wow. with, okay. that, w- with that being said, I think we're still just kind of, um, maybe it is still the quiet before the storm. Uh, mm-hmm. I do know that in Sioux Falls, uh, Smithfield, which is their meat packing plant, that they just had 80 positive cases. Wow. Wow. So okay. once they start getting those outbreaks, it'll, it'll explode. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a, it's just a crazy, crazy world we live in right now. It's just, uh, it's unbelievable. Well, and part um, of it too is the testing, but testing to get the testing. I just got off with my, one of the lab directors and for our little area, we have 30 tests. And that's wow. to be divided between five providers and we're testing maybe, I mean, so we have to have such extraordinarily strict standards yes. to be able to yes. test anybody. And um, so it's like, we might be testing two to five patients a day. And um, I really, I really question our specificity of the testing um, just like the influenza test, I mean, it's only at best 70% with the sense, excuse me, sensitivity of the test, not specificity, sensitivity of the test, because I have patients that I, I just on clinical presentation, I thought they probably were COVID positive and they were non-detected. So... When when you're when you're giving these tests, Julie, what's the turnaround time to get the results back for for your area? Um, well, we had to test a few healthcare workers, and they were within 24 hours, so they're they're okay. putting those up in as priority. But some of okay. them are as long as 48 to hours to some sometimes five days. Yeah. Okay. And so, so then I questioned though that sensitivity of 
okay, so those swabs have been laying there for how long? Yes. And yes. are we are we getting way back there in the nasopharyngeal area and doing both sides and um, spinning that swab, you know, thoroughly into the back? So, I mean, that the, the test is not a fun test to do. I mean, it's a pretty invasive it, it, test. It doesn't look fun, Julie. I've seen the videos of the drive-bys, you know, the drive-through testing and they they shove that thing way up there so they do yeah and and so so that's that's the other i mean you've also got human error involved yes. you've got this you know the the, people the test sitting that. around but yeah that's it that's i i mean i hate to tell you that i don't have any big crazy exciting stories to tell you but i'm telling you this is the reality of what we're seeing mm -hmm. <laughs> So, Julie, sorry I'm coming in late. Have you guys seen any definite positives? Yes, we yeah. have. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, I, we have three in our county that we know of that were positive, but they they convalesced at home and were fine. Um, now, I know that over kind of in the Johnston area, they've, they've had a little bit more of an outbreak, and um, they have... Um, they've had a few deaths. Interestingly enough, my mom is a family nurse practitioner in South Dakota. I'm originally from South mm -hmm. Dakota over by Huron. And uh, in her area, in this little Beetle County area, the state representative, um, Bob Glanzer, uh, was 74 and tested positive for COVID-19 and just recently died. Um, mm -hmm. He had been on the ventilator oh. and, his, and his niece, who was a school teacher, 51 years old, and this has all been in the national news and in the papers, um, really had no um, underlying issues, passed away after 48 hours. She had some shortness of breath. She was sent to the area hospital, was put on the ventilator and then passed away. So oh. I know, I know that th the thing is, is when you live and work in a small town, you know, everyone. And so yeah. we right. take care of our family and friends. And so when something like that, that devastating happens, it wakes people up. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah, that's so heavy. And you know, I step back and I look at you and Cassandra and you guys are obviously ones in rural Iowa, ones in really busy Orange County. And so, you know, worlds away as far as like patient volume. But the common denominator is that as providers, you guys are both doing your absolute best to provide the type of care that needs to happen right now during this crisis to the best of your abilities. Definitely. It's a work in progress for sure. I get 17 emails a day that I have to sift through and try to figure out the new criteria and what to do and new PPE and new testing that we have. It's a lot. Yeah. And have you um, had access to the new Abbott testing for the rapid test? Not, not yet. I hear it's in the pipeline, but we're a lot like you. We have very few tests. We have strict criteria. I'm sure there's so many more people that have it that don't know at this point. In fact, one of my biggest stresses at the beginning of the pandemic was not seeing really sick people, but the conversation I had to have with people time after time again, why we couldn't test them because they were scared, they were angry, and I just had to say, look, we don't have the test. And it was true. So <laughs> I would kind of steal myself for that because I wanted to test them. I want to know. And you're right. I've done tests where I thought for sure somebody had it. They had been to Seattle. Their family was all sick. They looked like they could have some type of upper respiratory. Flu was negative, although we stopped doing flu. And then it was negative. So I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to be at the very beginning. <laughs> I, I just know that this whole pandemic has shown every single weakness that we have in the healthcare system. And we have to change how we do things because we, we are paid to take care of 
you know, the big surgeries. I mean, that's how hospitals are paid. Mm -hmm. And to, to do the big procedures, we are not paid enough to take care of sick people. Amen. Well, on that, on that note, Julie and Cassandra, I wrote down a question that I wanted to ask to the both of you. And that question is, how do you think that this whole thing will affect healthcare going forward? What, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, having had a conversation with my friend who is a general surgeon, who I talked to him yesterday, um, and he, he owns his own practice, and he's like, I am so bored. You know, we, they've got these surgeons yeah. that are looking and begging for call and jobs. And I, what, I, what I'm going to say is going to be pretty controversial, but there's a reason why there's a shortage of family practice providers and why physician assistants and nurse practitioners are on the front line because we take care of people on the front line and we're cheap and the hospitals don't have to pay us. Very true. Nonetheless, um, and I'm not trying to make light of it, Julie, is we, again, for us who are not on the front lines, like the two of you, you know, we, we watch the news every day and I saw in the news this morning a story of a woman who recovered from COVID and there was a video of a bunch of healthcare providers in masks clapping as she was being wheeled out of the hospital into the arms of her husband to go home after being in video. the ICU for three years. You saw that, right? Yeah. And yeah. my first thought was, no, that, first of all, yes, it's great. I mean, what a great story to have someone survive this, right? Based upon the stories we've been hearing, but shouldn't we be applauding all the people who are applauding her? I mean, you guys are on the front lines of this. Mm -hmm. you're, you're personally being exposed. You're putting yourself in danger, quite frankly, uh, of, of being exposed to this virus by helping other people. And I, I don't know if we can emphasize that enough. Yeah. And it doesn't end in the emergency department. You guys, you know, like Mark's saying, you bring it home and it's this constant, like, do you find yourself like Cassandra, do you find yourself ever um, kind of checking yourself for a fever or, you know, looking out for those symptoms more often? Oh, absolutely. And my temperature is taken every day when I go to work, which is kind of interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah. So is yeah. mine. I have to log my temperature every day before I come to work. Um, I have, and this is the thing, I have college kids that all had to come home. So my house is full. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I strip in my garage. I've got a laundry <laughs> basket yeah. with my robe sitting there and I wrap myself in the robe and I, and I go straight to the shower. Yeah. I've never washed my hair so much in my life. It is very raggedy right now. And I finally bought a bunch of scrub caps to wear over it, but you still just feel like you could be inundated with the virus. But I don't know. It's not a huge stressor for me. I think it was at the very beginning because we really didn't have PPE. I was given a mask and I had to, I was told that I was going to have to wear it for 14 days. But Right behind that came new PPE, and now I feel much more protected. I don't know. It's, it's a bit less of a stressor for me, I think. Because in the ER, you see sick people. You know, you, I, I go and I do lumbar punctures on people that might have meningitis. I mean, you see people with tuberculosis. You're used to it. It was just so overwhelming, and there was no pause, and there wasn't any plan in place, and there wasn't the appropriate equipment. So I hope if healthcare changes, it will be more in the hands of the practitioners and less in admin to decide when to sound the alarm, when to get the equipment that we need. Um, Amen. Yeah, because I, I think it always comes from the top down. And then the people that were in the emergency department that at that point, I was very scared. You could say things and it was like, well, we'll see what we can do. We're working on it. 
I just don't think there was the same amount of fire underneath it. Now there is definitely as the death toll grows. Yes. Yes. I, I, I 100% agree on everything she said. So I, I'm coming from the perspective that my husband is a Lieutenant Colonel in the um, Army National Guard and was deployed to Afghanistan. And when all this was coming out and, you know, he had all of this protection in the army because there were, there were certain soldiers that did not have um, appropriate protection. And he's just like, you are heading to war soldier. And he, <laughs> you know, it, you know, and, and I do have to say kudos to my admin. She is an RN. And uh, we have plenty of PPE. We have plenty of N95. So uh, we, we are good that way. I will say that. Now, when I, I did go to the bigger tertiary um, area and they gave me one N95 and said, this is your number, put it in the brown paper yeah. bag. And yeah. That, that was a little like, I got one bullet, I guess. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, put it in the bag and then take it out of the bag that has the virus in it now? Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was pretty crazy. But hence we flatten the curve so that we can get those things. And now we have some protection. Well, speaking of, of, of flattening the curve, um, what would you say? Because I guess the, the idea right now is maybe we'll relax restrictions here towards the end of the month. I mean, obviously this is a, an evolving thing. If you guys were running the COVID-19 task force for the government, what would you say to re reducing restrictions, say at the end of this month? Hmm. Did you want to go first, Cassandra? Well, I'm, my feeling is that we were always flattening the curve in order to give ourselves some time. There's no vaccine. It's a novel virus. Eventually, they're going to have to relax restrictions. I'm hoping in stages and just kind of test it out and then kind of pull back if it gets overwhelming. I don't know about the end of this month, though. I was thinking more the middle end of May. Um, yeah, but that's a tough one. I think it's a tough question for everyone. There doesn't seem to be a consensus in government or in public health or but it was never my thought that we would beat the virus completely. We're just flattening it to give everybody more time and not be so overwhelmed by it. Yeah. I, uh, I think our government um, has done a good job in having each state governor take control of what they are going to do for the shelter in place and the quarantine due to populations because again we have Kim Reynolds as our governor and Christy Nome in South Dakota and I think they're 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 doing a lot of the same things for each county. So the Beetle County, the county in South Dakota that I had mentioned before, they issued kind of a shelter in place for that county. Um, versus the other counties that really didn't have any outbreaks. So, I mean, I think they're going to have to really start with kind of, they're going to have to start very minute in areas before they're going to let people, you know, just start running about mm -hmm. because, you know, it, it only takes one big family gathering for, for a big outbreak to happen. And you being in Orange County, you might have resources for those people, but we don't. Mm. I mean, yeah. and, and maybe it's, it's just like a population based where they're going to um, let up some of the, the restrictions is, is what I feel they should probably be able to do. Um, we, we have farmers. You know, they're, they're going to have to, you know, they're, they're going to, they're out there starting to plant right now and they're going to be on the roads and then pretty soon you're going to have to open up our elevators and we're going to have to, 
start opening up some of our um, other plants here because economically we can't sustain this. Yeah. And it sounds like it's so important for the rest of the country. Right. It's our food source. It's our food source. Yeah. Here in Iowa. We, we provide the, we feed the world. Yeah. Talk about essential. I wish that the antibody test would be up and running. I think that's going to be a game changer for places like California that may have more people that were affected than we know because we had such limited tests. So they have that Stanford test coming out, I think, next week where they took measures of different groups to see if they had antibodies. I'm very interested in that because I think that might help open the economy if people have antibodies, but probably not so much rural and middle America as the coast that have been struggling with it, maybe longer. So we're almost already out of time, but I have one more question for you guys. What gives you hope during this crazy time? Um, people's optimism. Mm -hmm. People um, making masks for me and my staff. I'm almost going to get emotional about this. But people sending me cards telling me how much they appreciate me and love me. It's yeah, amazing, I mean, Julie. I'd say exactly the same thing. Exactly. It was, it's almost surreal to suddenly feel like you're in the middle of that you're on the front lines and that people are so supportive. And I do think people come together. I mean, it's really amazing. Even that Facebook commercial I saw the other night where somebody was saying a poem and I am getting teared up. It was really, it was really sweet. And then the point of the commercial was that people and faces and community were so important. And I think we'll come out of that knowing that more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's one thing, like, I mean, working in the emergency room, you're pretty hardened with a lot of stuff. We, we see a lot of crappy, terrible stuff. And to get emotional, <laughs> that's a big thing. Yeah. And to feel so supported is a yes. thing and not what you always feel. Yes. But I feel it now and I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, on behalf of, you know, Mark and I and, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone listening, thank you guys so much for all you're doing and putting yourself out there every day and, and uh, being strong you know, for everyone out there that is weak and, uh, what you're doing is priceless. And I don't think there's enough words to say to, of how Amen. thankful, you know, that, that I am. And, uh, you know, there's Cassandra here in her scrubs ready, ready to leave, you know, right after this, this podcast. So, I mean, I can't thank you guys enough and I just wish your family's health and strength and, uh, stay safe. You know. Summer. Yeah. And nice meeting you, Julie. Yes, you too. Good Thank luck. you. Stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye All right, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you both very much. Thank you guys for listening to our COVID-19 bonus episode number three. We feel incredibly fortunate to have had Julie and Cassandra um, on the line today. And uh, as you know, we're all social distancing. We're out of the studio and we're doing our best to stay home while... Um, those two are out in the mix, out on the front lines, and we're so thankful again to you, Julie and Cassandra, for all that you do and the time that you gave us, um, you know, for our Doc Lounge podcast. Um, if you would like to be a guest on the Doc Lounge podcast, email the Doc Lounge at PacificCompanies.com. And on behalf of Pacific Companies, we wish you guys health, safety, positivity, and love during this crazy time. Talk to you all soon.